Micah chapter 5. He's what they call a minor prophet, but I don't buy into the minor and major. Prophet's a prophet. Micah chapter number 5 and verse number 1. Micah 5, 1. Now gather thyself in troops, O daughter of troops. He hath laid siege against us. They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Yeah. Father, bless this holy word, yeah. Lord, as we send it forth now in thy holy name. Amen. Amen, amen. Micah is a contemporary with Isaiah. Isaiah is approximately 700 B.C. We all know about the prophecy of Isaiah in chapter 7 and verse number 14. That's what it says. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel is a Hebrew word which means that God is with us. Or God will be with you. God is with us. So therefore, when we call him Emmanuel, then we're saying that in the birth of this virgin child is God with us. And we notice that Micah tells us where he's going to be born. Chapter number 7. But if you go back to the book of Isaiah, chapter, or chapter 5 of Micah, if you go back to Isaiah chapter 7 and verse number 10, I want you to notice the context of all of this because it's important. Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 10, Moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God, as ask it either in the depth or in the height above. Now watch carefully. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men? But will you weary my God also? Ahaz was a hypocrite. Ahaz was one of the worst. He, he fit in the category of all of the wicked kings of Israel. And the Lord said, now you have enemies to the north. You have enemies surrounding you. And what are you going to do about it? Where is your victory going to come from? And the Lord said, I'm going to show you a sign, Ahaz. Ask of me and I'll give you that sign. And Ahaz comes across with this false humility and says, I will not ask the Lord. But my friend, God was, is going to say and speak what he's going to say, regardless of whether you cooperate with him or not. And so we read over here where he says, a virgin shall conceive. Now what happens here in the book of Isaiah chapter 7 is the Davidic throne, the throne of David, is in question. If it can be overrun by the pagans, if it can be overrun by the enemies and done away with, and Israel could no longer be a people upon the face of this earth, then all the prophecies in the Old Testament are null and void. But that cannot happen. His word cannot be broken. His word is forever settled in heaven. And so the Davidic throne in Isaiah chapter number 7 is going to be sealed. And it's going to be sealed by a virgin birth. And he wants them to understand the time is going to come when a virgin shall bring forth a son. And when that virgin brings forth a son, this will establish the throne of David forever. Amen. And we know what happens in the book of Matthew. It was the day of Herod the king. He was an Edomite, a, one, a, a, a descendant of Esau that was trying to usurp the throne of David. Had no business on it whatsoever. And yet, my dear friend, God Almighty brings his king into the world. When the Lord Jesus Christ is born in Bethlehem of Judea, he is born in the days of Herod the king, according to the book of Matthew. In the days of Augustus, the emperor of Rome. As a matter of fact, Rome was in power. An Idumean tyrant was on the throne. Israel had blind religion in that day. And, but we have pagans coming from the east, wise men who follow a star. That star, as I said Wednesday night, more than likely, came to them because they had the book of, uh, a book of Daniel that was written while Israel was in Babylonian captivity. And here we have them that do not have a Bible, but they got part of a Bible, and that's good enough. Amen. 
All word, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Amen. I don't know, you might be able to get saved by the word and. <laughs> the Bible is the scripture. You take the scripture in, you're taking the living word into your soul. But in any event, where they came from the east, followed the light they had, and the light they had brought them to the light. Light gives more light. If you want light, God will give you light. And when he gives you light, he'll give you more light. Light leads to light. When you reject the light, you go into darkness, and darkness leads to more darkness. Shall the blind lead the blind? That's what happens to us today. I hope you're in this house this morning, and I hope you're shouting because God's given you something that a lot of people on this earth don't have. They're living in pagan darkness, all kinds of religions that do not know God, that walk in ignorance. But here you have the truth in your hands, the living word of the living God. And so the pagans came from the east. The faithful shepherds were in the field. And the consecrated Israelites, as, as uh, Simeon and Anna, were in the temple. And the holy family, the holy family, yeah. there be called down to Bethlehem to bring forth a child. Now, all of these circumstances converged. All of these things came together at a certain time and a certain place so that the scripture could be fulfilled. Yeah. If it was left into the hands of a human being to try to figure out how to get all this to happen, you'd fail every single time. God's word cannot be broken. And so this babe that was born in Bethlehem of Judea 2,000 years ago is Emmanuel. And he said, you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. Jesus is Jesus. It means Jehovah saves. The Jehovah covenant keeping God of the Old Testament, Jehovah saves. And does he save? He saves in every way that you can be saved. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, he saved to the uttermost. All that come to God through every way you can be saved. He doesn't leave one thing about your being that cannot be saved. Remember that today. Are you bound by drugs? Then he can save you from it. Are you bound by sexual sins? He can save you from it. Are you bound by unbelief? He can save you from it. Amen. He can save you from everything that applies to human beings. So we read in the book of, uh, in the scripture that Bethlehem was chosen for the Lord Jesus to be born. Why Bethlehem? Because it's the city of David. And Joseph was the house and lineage of David. Now, how do you bring all that together? You bring it together because God intended for it to be that way. So they come to Bethlehem, and she was, she was well along. She was nine months pregnant and ready to bring forth her firstborn son, and lay him in swaddling clothes. And so this virgin daughter of Zion, let me lay that foundation for you this morning. If you do not believe in the virgin birth of Christ, you may be a good religious person, you may be moral and all of that, but you don't know the Lord. You've got to have that basic foundation that all the rest of it stands upon. Born of a virgin. Amen. Born of a virgin. And so according to the time of life, she brought forth her son. Mary knew things no one else knew. Mary experienced something no one else ever experienced. Mary was different from every other human being that ever walked this earth. There's only one Mary. And she brought forth her, forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. That's why we're here this morning. That's why all of this, it's about the birth of Christ. It's about the birth of the Son of God. Is there anyone in the house this morning that doubts that Christ was born? You believe he was born? That's called the advent. I believe in the advent, don't you? I believe Christ was born, and I believe he came to this world. As the scripture said, he was born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem is a Hebrew word. It means house of bread. Yeah. Beth, house, Bethlehem, bread. So it's Bethlehem, the house of bread. Now, of course, you have the bread of Moses, and the bread of Moses could keep you alive. It could sustain your life, but you've got the bread of God that gives life. There's difference in the bread. In John chapter number 6 and verse number 63, look what he said to them about this bread. The house of God, John chapter number 6 and verse number 63. We read these words. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. In other words, my flesh, his physical body cannot save you. You're not saved by the man Christ Jesus in his flesh. You're saved by his sacrifice on the cross at Calvary. Verse 63, it is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. If you'll listen and believe what God said in his word this morning, you'll walk out of this house today with something alive inside you. It's alive. How do you feel about that? There's something inside you alive right now. It's a completely total separate life than your life. 
It's a life that has been forever. It's an everlasting. It's an eternal life. It's the life of God because God and his word cannot be separated. Two and the same, one and the same. But notice what Peter said in verse number 68. Peter has a way of saying things. Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Amen. The words of eternal life. Do you believe the word of God? Here's another basic foundation of the Christian faith. Not only the virgin birth, but the inspiration of Scripture. Because if the Bible's not inspired, then you're left on your own to sail the sea of ignorance and you don't know whether you're coming or you're going and you're turning to this light and that light and this thing and that thing and you're trying to put all this junk together in man's wisdom and you're trying to make sense out of that and live in this world. Folks, this Bible is inspired word of God. Theos noustos. It means God breathed. Amen. Like he breathed into, no, into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, he breathed his word into holy men of God who spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit of God. Therefore, I got hold of something that is an anchor for the soul. This is something I can believe. I can read this at the deathbed. I can read this at the funeral parlor. I can read this when I'm hurting. I can read this anytime, and it'll give me life. That's the good thing about the book. It's life. It's a book of life. So Bethlehem is a place of bread. The, house, the, breath, the bread of God is a wonderful place. It was a little place. It was southeast of Jerusalem. Not too far, maybe five, six miles, but it was a place that according to the scripture, the Messiah was to come forth into this land. We read a beautiful story about Bethlehem in the Old Testament. You've read about Naomi in the book of Ruth, how there was a famine in the land. That famine included Bethlehem, the house of bread. And so they left there and they went off into Moab. Moab and Ammon were the two children born of incest from Lot. That's not a very good start, is it? The Bible said into the 10th generation, a Moabite is not allowed into the congregation of the Lord. To the 10th generation. That's a long way. In plain words, God had no use for Moab. And Milcom was one of the gods of Moab along with many others. And so we find Ruth born in ignorance, born in a pagan land. And we find Naomi that leaves her country and her home and the house of bread. And she goes down into Moab. And my dear friend, I don't know how much preaching she did. And notice that she lost everything she had while she was there. And when, when Ruth saw all of this, it makes you wonder what was it about uh, Naomi that caused Ruth to hook her faith into the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But whatever it was, she did. Your God will be my God. Your faith is my faith. Whether thou goest, I go. Whether thou diest, I die. And here's something about Ruth that is wonderful in that book. Ruth was the great-grandmother of David. Here over here in Moab, born of incest, God reaches in there and he pulls out a woman and puts her in the genealogy of Christ in, Gen in Matthew 1 and she is the great grandmother of the Lord Jesus Christ. It didn't work simple though. When she came in with Naomi, they came into the country and they were hungry and Boaz met her. He had a Boaz waiting for her and he was a rich man in his day and he had fields and his fields were full of food. And so she came and she gleaned in the fields of Boaz. He found out who was out there gleaning. He said, leave her a few handfuls on purpose. He has a way about him. God has a way about him. He has a way that if there's anything that touches the heart of God, it's somebody that is down and out. It is somebody hungry. It is somebody that's been rejected by society. It is somebody that just doesn't fit in. Nobody does not fit in with God. He made a place for you at the cross at Calvary. Yes, so yes, Boaz said, leave her handfuls on purpose. And so they did. And according to the time of God and the purpose of God, Ruth began to cast her eye upon Boaz because of the love he showed her. And she began to move toward him. And there in the threshing floor, because this is where they separate the seed from the chaff, she laid down at his feet. The threshing floors in the Old Testament teach so many great truths, but here's a wonderful one. Yeah. She laid down at the feet of Boaz, and there at the feet of Boaz at the threshing floor. The threshing floor is when the wind comes and it blows the chaff away, and the seed falls to the ground because the seed has substance. Yeah. Chaff is just air. <laughs> There's nothing to it. You know, all the prattle you hear from people, just empty, vain words. Yeah. 
no substance to it. But if there is wheat and it's a germ and it falls to the ground, then my dear friend, the Holy Spirit, because that's the picture of the Holy Spirit, the wind blowing, separates the chaff from the wheat. In plain words, he was purifying the faith of Ruth there in the threshing floor. Process of time, Boaz accepted her, loved her. But he was a kinsman redeemer, and there's one closer than him. So he went to the gate, and he said, Oh, such a one, Abimelech, and he was of the house of uh, Elimelech. He said, It is your, your privilege to purchase a field, to purchase the portion that belonged to Elimelech. And he said, I'll do that. And then Boaz said, But if you buy that field, you get Ruth too. You have to take her. And he said, no, I can't do that. That'll mar my inheritance. I can't do that. And so Boaz said, all right, let it be so now in the presence of all of these. I will pay the price for the field of Elimelech. I will buy. I will pay for Ruth and for everything that goes with her. He bought and paid for us. That's a picture of our kinsman redeemer. He paid for what we are today, man. When anything given to him, nothing was given to him. He earned everything that we have. And he earned his own righteousness too, a righteousness that did not exist. And so Ruth became the great grandmother of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a beautiful thing, don't you think? Threshing floors have a way of separating. Threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite on the top of Moriah separates, separates. It has for that purpose. Now in the book of Genesis chapter 35, and verse number 18, there's another beautiful story of, uh, of, of, of uh, Bethlehem. In the Old Testament, Bethlehem is also referred to as Ephrata. Ephrata means fruitful. Bethlehem means house of bread. And here's a story in Genesis 35 and verse number 18. And it says this, It came to pass as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Benami, but his father called him Benjamin. And Rachel died and was buried in the way of Ephrata, and her tomb is still there to this day. And Jewish women go to the tomb of Rachel. I've been to the tomb of Rachel. It says dome tomb. They'll go to that tomb and they'll pray for God to open their womb and give them children because she prayed for God to open her womb. Leah was the one that built the house of Israel, and Rachel was barren, so she cried unto God. And so Jewish women go there and they pray for the Lord to open their womb, give them children. The Bible says in verse 19, she died and was buried in the way to Ephrata, and which is Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar upon her grave that is the pillar of Rachel's grave unto this day. Now we're talking about Bethlehem. We're talking about the house of bread. We're talking about the bread of life. We're talking about a place where life comes from. I don't know why they didn't go to Jerusalem. Why didn't they choose for Christ to be born in Jerusalem, the city of the great king on the top of Moriah? No, God meant for him to be born in Bethlehem, in the house of bread. And so he was born in the house of bread. And here's a woman dying in the house of bread. What a thing we have here. No, we have a thing that points to what life is all about, life and death. On her hand, she called Benani. She said, this is the son of my sorrow. There in Bethlehem, a son of my sorrow. But then Jacob said, no, 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 not going to be. You call him Benjamin or Benjamin as we say in English. He is the son of my right hand. He's the son of my power and my authority. Now, wait a minute. You can't have both. Yes, you can. For the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible said, God saw the travail of his soul and was satisfied. By my righteous servant shall many be justified. The Lord Jesus Christ was a suffering servant of God. When he came the first time, he came as the suffering Savior and Mashiach of all mankind. When he comes the second time, he comes as the right hand of God. And power and authority, amen. That's what you got here in Bethlehem. What a picture. Shows you both comings of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the son of my sorrow, a man acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him, Isaiah tells us. But oh, when he comes this next time, I want to be there when he comes the next time. I want to come with him when he comes the next time. I want to see that power and that might and that glory. The kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord. And it's Christ. He'll take that which belongs to him. Amen. The day's coming. You say, well, I'm a millennial. I don't care what millennial you are. The Lord's coming back again. <laughs> Amen. 
Be nice about it. You may be my brother and love the Lord. But I tell you right now, he's coming again. If I go away, I'll come again to receive into myself. Now, in 2 Samuel chapter 23 and verse number 15 is a beautiful picture. And this is something that shows you the character and nature of David. You know how many times you hear the Bible say, he's a man after mine own heart. I've chosen David. And we all know about David's adultery. We all know about how his treachery toward Uriah. We understand all that. We've read it. But we also know in the book of Isaiah how he got right with God. Yes, he did. If you want to get a sinner right with God, you read over there where David said, Against thee and thee only have I sinned. My sin is ever before my face. I can't get away from it. can't hide from it. We read that about David. So in the Old Testament, we have a real repentant sinner. And that's David. This is why God's able to speak to David in spiritual things that a lot of people don't think about and they overlook. Notice what it says in the book of 2 Samuel 23, verse number 15. 2 Samuel 23, 15. I'm sorry, I didn't give you this, the text. 2 Samuel 23, 15. And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of where? Bethlehem, which is by the gate. He's breathing out his desire from his soul. He has mighty men that have gathered around him. Notice what it says in chapter 23, first word, first, first verse. These be the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, said, and so forth. The last thing he said, these of y'all listen to this, because this is what he leaves us. This is the last thing he's going to say. And we read over here where he says, he longed and said, oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. Why would he say that? Because he grew up in Bethlehem. That's why it's the city of David. Bethlehem, Bethlehem, house of bread, but it also becomes the house of water because this is a well, and water comes out of a well. You remember what he said to the woman at the well? If you knew the gift of God, who it was, you'd ask of me, and I'd give you living water. Oh, Jacob, our father, yes, I know Jacob did, but I'll give you something that's greater than the water in that well. That is a type and a picture of the living water. The Lord Jesus Christ is spelled out in the Gospel of John, the living water. So notice what we have here. David says, I'm thirsty. Not so really so much thirsty for water itself, but thirsty for where it came from. Because if I know I've got it in my hand, I'm, it takes me back to my childhood. It takes me back to a better time. You ever been like that? We call it nostalgia. You ever think about when you were just a kid, boy, you know, a girl? Uh, take you back to your children. Remember when your mom and your dad and your family and all that were around? You can, you can go back in your mind a time like that and just sit there for a while and think about it. Think about what's going on before you. Remember, you're living in, in, in an immediate time. The, uh, there's a word for it. I can't think of it. But you're living in a time right now. But in a minute from now, it'll be history. You see, and on and on and on and on it goes. So I can remember my childhood, and so could David. And he wanted water from this well. Three of his mighty men heard him sigh. They heard David. They heard him. They must have been close enough to David to hear him breathe. They loved him. and They were mighty men, the Bible said. They were warriors. The Philistines had gathered against them. And so they, they said, we're going to get him some water. And so they, they, listen, they wedged their way through the line of the Philistines. They drove through it. That took courage. That took courage and desire and dedication. And they got the water. And they brought it back to David and said, David, here's the water that you requested. This is the water. He looked at that water, and then the Spirit the spirits spoke to his soul. And David said, hold on a minute. You hazarded your life. You, you, you hazarded your blood. You went across the enemy's line to bring this water back to me. This water means a whole lot more now than just water. This represents your blood. That's what he said to them. Verse number 16. The three mighty men break through the host of the Philistines. Verse 17. Now look what he said in verse 16. And took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink thereof, but poured it out into the Lord. He said, this is too precious for me to drink. I'm going to give it to God. Yeah. It's, it's too great for me. It's above me. Have you ever had anything like that happen? Yeah. 
This is spiritual truth, folks. This is, this is the man that is after God's own heart. He understands spiritual things. This is spiritual. He says, no, I'm not going to drink this water. Verse 17, he said, be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is not this the blood of the men that went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore, he would not drink it. These things did these three mighty men. And so we have a record of David's understanding of spiritual truth. Listen, folks, I'm me. I'm a physical being. I'm a man. But what I am is I am. But what I preach to you is like the water that came back from Bethlehem. You see, that's above me. When you begin to understand that there is the profane and the holy, you understand that? The profane can't do anything for your soul, but the holy can. And when David said, this is blood, this represents your life, you gave yourself for this. I can't drink this. And he poured it out to the Lord. And so the water that came out of Bethlehem is water that represents life. Because if you can see past that water, look at the blood that was shed on the cross. Look at what was given for you. When the death angel passed through Egypt at midnight, no blood on the doorpost and lintels, they were safe. But if they didn't have any blood over the doorpost and lintels, the death angel didn't care if you were a Hebrew or a Moabite or a Jew. or He didn't care. He was coming in and he was going to take the firstborn. So the blood. And the Bible says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And you see the blood this morning? That's another foundational truth as Christians. Virgin birth, inspiration of scripture, and the blood atonement. The blood covenant. I heard a man say to me years ago, he said, I want to live that, that slaughterhouse religion. So what is it? Good works? Is that what your faith is about? What you produce here on this earth, how good you can be, what you think that's going to be acceptable to God above what his son did when he went to the cross, the perfect, sinless, righteous son of God and gave himself for us. No, friend, it's the blood, nothing but the blood. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. I will pass, I will pass, I will pass over you. The revelation of the character of David. That's something we need, folks. We need that spiritual understanding. We need to understand that it's not about some tyrant, some religious tyrant. When those men came back, he could have said to them, I'm proud of you. It shows your dedication to God and your strength in the Lord. No, that's not what he said. No, he didn't say that. It broke him and humbled him. Hey, Humility is one of the greatest virtues that you'll ever find in this world. No, he said, I'm not going to do that. I can't do that. And so he did. He poured it out. On the Internet, we've got We Three Poems of Bethlehem Are. Now listen to this story. Thomas Kettle was an intellectual colossus, a barrister, an MP, member of parliament, Professor of Economics, an Irish volunteer who in 1914 responded to John Redmond. John Redmond was a nationalist Irishman, built the national identity. John Redmond's call to support the war by enlisting the British Army. His letters from his few months at the front reflect an acute sense of the routine proximity of personal mortality. It was at the Battle of the Somme in 1916 Three million men fought in that battle. Over a million men, over a million men were either killed or wounded at the Battle of the Somme. This man is an intellectual. In other words, he analyzes what's going on and looks for the intent, purpose, what's happening, what's said from Washington, and what happens on the field. Yes. Listen to him. His letters from his few months at the front reflect an acute sense of the routine proximity of personal mortality, the pains of distance from Ireland and separation from his family. His poem, To My Daughter Betty, 
was retrieved from a field near Eulamont on the Somme front on 4 September 1916, five days before he was killed in battle. The poem, now listen carefully, the poem poses and responds to its own question. Now watch the posing, and then he'll give you the response. Here's the poem. In wiser days, my darling rosebud blown, to beauty proud as was your mother's prime, you'll ask why I abandoned you, my own, and the dear heart that was your baby throne. In beautiful words, he says, you're going to wonder why I'm here, why I left you, why I went to war. You probably don't understand. And then the next verse says, to dice with death. You see, this is the way he looked at the battlefield. To dice means to throw the dice, to gamble with death. Yes. I left you to gamble with death. He tells you why. Then he tells you what he learned on the battlefield. Listen to this. Know that we fools, now with the foolish dead, died not for flag, nor king, nor emperor, but for a dream born in a herdsman's shed and for the secret scripture of the poor. Did you get that? He said, I'm out here in this battlefield. I'm learning something, being surrounded by death. That the ideology, that when you march through the cities and the bands are playing and all of that, that won't hold you up out here on the battlefield. Right. Out here on the battlefield, you've got to have something that's greater than that. Right. And now look at this. What a beautiful thing. What a beautiful thing for a dream born in a herdsman's shed. What's the dream? What's the dream when Christ came and the angel said, Peace unto men. Peace, the peace. You know what he's saying? He's saying in his heart, I know these Germans over here on the other side are probably praying too yes. and praying to the same God I'm praying to. Right. And we're killing each other right. because this has nothing to do with that Christ that was born in that little manger 2,000 right. years ago. That peace that he died for, I won't. Yes. That's what he's saying. Where is it? I want that peace. See, he it says it's for the secret scripture of the poor. The scripture itself has great truths to reveal to us if you want them. If you want the light, you'll get the light. When you get the light, you'll get more light. The light shineth in the darkness, but the darkness comprehended it not. How many of you understand the peace that passeth all understanding? A peace, he said, my give I, I, my, I give my peace unto you, not as the world giveth, give I thee. My peace I give to you. What's his peace? His peace is the same peace he had at Gethsemane. Yes. The same peace he had at the cross. I want that peace, don't you? Yes. I do. I do. Yes. This is not so much an anti-war poem on my part because there may be times when you have to go to battle. That's right. But you better do some thinking and some praying right. when the Bible says the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. When he comes back, he's going to take that which belongs to him. Would you walk down here this morning and ask you to do this? Because this is Christmas. And say, Lord, give me an understanding of what this preacher is talking about, about that little baby that was born in that, man, in that manger. Really, what is that about? That baby that was born in the manger. He, bought, he died for Americans and he died for Germans. He died for Frenchmen. He, he died for Africans. He died for all mankind. He tasted death for every man. All of us. Yes, Peace of God that yes, passeth understanding. Bow your head. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I, I've given them. Thank you for helping me, too. Thank you for moving my soul. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Lord, I know this poem's over 100 years old. But oh, my, how this man speaks from his soul and how he sees himself once he gets to the battlefield. He begins to really understand life when he's surrounded with death. And our Father, we live in a culture like that today. People are dropping and dying all around us. God, help us. Draw us into a spiritual truth. Lord, help us today to search our heart, to search our range, to search our soul, and see if we believe what we should believe. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Stand up and sing. Brother, what